The Outer Worlds is a first-person role-playing game released in 2019. It was developed by Obsidian Entertainment, formerly known as Black Isle. You may have heard about Obsidian from arguably their most popular release, Fallout New Vegas, which was revered by many, including myself, to be the best Fallout in the franchise. Obsidian prides themselves on making games that strictly follow the role-playing element in an RPG. They craft games with emphasis on dialogue, character building, and player choice. Some of their other titles are Alpha Protocol, Neverwinter Nights 2, South Park The Stick of Truth, and the Pillars of Eternity series. I mention this because half of these games, including Outer Worlds, may have never been released, thanks to one point on a less than reliable game review site. The deal between Obsidian and Bethesda, in terms of New Vegas, was that there would be a straight payment to Obsidian for their work. But, if New Vegas managed to score an 85% on Metacritic, the company would receive a bonus. New Vegas scored an 84%, one point off the score required for them to receive their bonus and help keep their company afloat. This is obscene on account of the fact that many game reviewers aren't really gamers at all. They are good at writing reviews, but shit at playing games, so it doesn't make a lot of sense to tie a large monetary bonus to a stupid review score. Instead, Bethesda should have given the bonus based on copies sold, or something that is less determinant on the opinions of people that probably don't play video games in the first place. I know that's a pretty hot take on game reviewers, but all you need to do is read the reviews of Pokemon Omega Ruby and Alpha Sapphire, Too Much Water, Dark Souls, Too Hard Needs an Easy Mode, and Cuphead, Too Hard, to realize that there is a strong majority of game reviewers that have no idea what the fuck they're talking about. Anyways, Obsidian was more of a third-party developer that would receive contracts from large studios to make games. They've worked with EA, Bethesda, and are now working with Microsoft. None of which are particularly good partners, but are still incredibly profitable studios. Regardless, because of their place as a smaller game studio, they were constantly in hot water financially, and after losing the New Vegas bonus, it looked like it was going to be curtains for Obsidian Entertainment. They would go on to crowdfund the Pillars of Eternity games before finding permanent residence with Microsoft Studios, who acquired the company in November of 2018. One month later, in December 2018, Outer Worlds was announced, and then released on October 25th of the following year. Obsidian may have had a rocky start in the games industry, but after experiencing their AAA success of Fallout New Vegas and now Outer Worlds, I am confident that this will be a game studio to keep your eye on for the time to come. Now to talk about the actual game. Outer Worlds is a recent release, and I will be spoiling some of the content involving the main story, along with broad spoilers pertaining to some of the side quests. One thing I suggest before we get into the nitty gritty is to play the game before you watch this. Games are best experienced blind, especially this game where there is depth and dialogue, options, and choices. I wouldn't want anyone to watch this and have their actions influenced thanks to what I discuss in this video. Otherwise, I'm not sure how long this review will be, but typically I like to ramble on for quite some time, so as usual I will have timestamps in the comments section if you want to skip around or happen to lose your place. As always, thanks for watching, and I hope you all enjoy. Anytime, sweetheart. You know where to find me. Here, take a candy with you. As usual, we'll start with the good, the meat and potatoes, the main quest and early character development. The game begins with you being awoken from a 70-year cryo-sleep. You pick your specific attributes, which boost certain skill trees' starting totals. You start by having average stats across the main categories, strength, dexterity, intelligence, perception, charm, and temperament, and are allowed 6 points to boost your stats to good or high. You can even gain more points by accepting debuffs and being below average or terrible in those categories I just listed. This mirrors the special stats from the Fallout games, but it is different enough to avoid a lawsuit. You'll find that there are many similarities to Fallout New Vegas in terms of game and quest design, which isn't a bad thing. I'm the type of person that believes in not fixing things that aren't broken. Next you have your skill tree, which is broken into categories and totals from 0 to 100. You get to pick a couple of these trees to receive immediate boosts, and then every time you level up you get 10 points to allocate into the trees of your choosing. Once a skill in that tree reaches 50, you can only level that skill further using individual points. For example, if my ranged tree had handguns, long guns, and heavy weapons at 46, 
I could choose to allocate 4 points to that tree, boosting all of those skills to 50. After which, I would have to choose if I wanted to put the remaining 6 points into just handguns. I would no longer have the option of leveling up all 3 skills to 56. These skills also grant straight bonuses every 20 points. So if there is a particular bonus that you want in a category, you may have to dedicate 50 individual points in order to get it, or 5 full levels. For example, the Long Guns 100 skill is, Long Gun Critical Hits Ignore 100% of Armor, which is a crazy good skill to have for players that are focusing on critical hits with Long Guns. After skills, you have perks, which are classic buffs to certain categories. You get one perk every even level, and unlock a new tier of perks after five unlocks in each category. By the end of the game, you should have five perks in each of these three tiers. Also, the maximum level in Outer Worlds is 30, so you should decide on a handful of skills to specialize in and let the others fall by the wayside. I love that there is a maximum level, because if there was the option to max out all stats, eventually you wouldn't really have a character, you would just be a god. This also forces players to choose what kind of character they want, and since choice is a major theme of the story, it is tying gameplay to story, which is always commendable. Not only because it is difficult to do, but this tethering also helps with immersing the player into the game's universe. This is great customization, and allows players to choose how they decide to play the game. Maybe you'll lie, persuade, and intimidate your way through the game. That's viable. Maybe you'll be as dumb as rocks, but the best gunslinger in all of Halcyon. Also viable. Maybe you'll sneak, hack, and lockpick your way into all the places you're not supposed to be, but are anyway. You get to design your character around what your playstyle is going to be throughout the playthrough, and if you find yourself hating the experience, then you can respec your character thanks to a machine on your ship. I had an overall average build with an emphasis on sneaking, critical hits, and long guns. I also had good speech checks, decent hacking, and decent lockpicking. I imagine that every player has a different way of tackling these kind of games, so when I say that no one's experience will be the same, I mean it. No two playthroughs will be alike. I missed out on a handful of speech checks towards the end, but could shoot my way out of any scrape I ran into. Some players will experience the opposite, struggling with combat but, but being able to lie, cheat, and steal their way to victory. What's nice too is that the game intends on different players having different playstyles and plans accordingly. Fallout 4 has many shortcomings in the overall quest design, since there is sometimes an illusion of choice rather than actual choice. Outer Worlds does not have this problem. You can beat this game with words, actions, or a combination of the two, depending on the type of character you have built, with plenty of speech and skill checks along the way. After creating your character, you are met by Phineas Wells. He is a scientist that managed to free you from your cryosleep, but is also a wanted criminal by a faction known as the Board. He explains that you are the only surviving member of the Hope, a lost ship housing thousands of Earth's brightest minds. You are the only one he was able to successfully revive, but there are still others that can be defrosted. He tasks you with finding Alex Hawthorne, a smuggler that knows Wells. You are released from an escape pod and fall onto your first planet, Terra 2. You also fall onto Hawthorne, so you find his ship, convince his AI, Ada, to let you be the new captain, and are sent to Edgewater to find a power regulator in, or in order to travel between planets. Edgewater is a small, struggling society where all the workers are practically slaves to the board. They all work in a cannery and their living conditions are terrible. You learn that there is another society made up of Edgewater deserters that also has a power regulator. You are tasked with deciding which society receives power and which gets switched off. Naturally, there is a peaceful option where societies can both work together but I really didn't like Edgewater, so I shut them down and stole their power regulator. From there, you are tasked with either heading to the Groundbreaker, a ship so large it houses an entire colony of people, or Monarch, a dangerous western type of planet that has been cut off from the board and the mega corporations that supply all of Halcyon. If you skip out on the Groundbreaker and head straight to Monarch, you will have to land far outside Stellar Bay, the main colony, and will have to make a dangerous sprint through the wilderness in order to access the city. 
Once you arrive in Stellar Bay, you are tasked with finding an information broker that will lead you closer to your overall goal. Find dimethyl sulfoxide, a chemical that Phineas needs to revive the rest of the colonists on Hope. You meet a companion named Nyoka, who guides you to the broker. You do some legwork for the broker involving his radio tower, and are then given the location of the chemical. From there, you travel to Byzantium to track down the chemical. You acquire it and return to Phineas. He then asks you to skip jump the Hope to outside his lab so that the colonists are more accessible to both of you. You infiltrate the ship and make the jump. Just as you arrive with the Hope in tow, Phineas is captured by the board and is sent to Tartarus, a prison planet. You free Phineas from the board's grasp, and that's it. Seems pretty short when I put it that way, doesn't it? And it is if you skip past all the dialogue options and don't roleplay in the roleplaying game. The depth of content comes from interacting with the world around you and the moral decisions you make as the game progresses. Plus, that isn't the only ending. For example, on Terra 2, you learn about the two factions and are given a decision that will determine the fate of civilized society on that planet. You learn about both societies and their leaders and are then able to decide based upon how you feel about them. Like I said, I hated Edgewater, so I turned them off and stole their regulator, but you can also turn off the Botanical Research Center and force the deserters to return to their mundane and routine lives, if you can even consider that a life. There's also the peaceful option, where the leader of Edgewater and the Botanical Gardens work together to find common ground and increase the quality of life for all the residents. You still get your regulator, but you are given choice that matters and choice that reshapes the world around you. On the Groundbreaker, you meet the Chief Engineer, and she explains that the Groundbreaker is at about situation critical. The temperature is rising at an alarming rate, and the Chief Engineer needs you to deal with the bandits that live in the basement, which is where the parts are that need fixing. You can shoot your way out and kill everyone down there, or you can peacefully enter and exit the bandits' domain through the use of speech checks. Moving on to Monarch, there are two factions, the iconoclasts that want to spread the word of a truly free and philosophical people, and the MSI, who are a faction attempting to reconnect with the board in order to get precious resources necessary to keep their society alive. This is the most interesting side content in the game, since you don't have to settle their feud before leaving, and because there is a ton of interaction required in order to bring these two groups together. The iconoclasts have a terrible leader, he values spreading his word across Halcyon rather than gaining more followers and protecting them. You do a handful of quests for his faction before finally overthrowing him and putting a much more competent person in charge. Alongside this, you also work with the leader of MSI, Sanjar, to find the data on the Iconoclasts and their leaders in order to determine whether or not their personalities and work ethics would be compatible enough to work together and find common ground along with a myriad of other quests for Sanjar, who is a character, to say the least. You bring the two leaders to neutral ground to have a meeting about peace and allowing the Iconoclast to live within the safety of Stellar Bay. You help negotiate them working together, and the two factions become one. So the main quest itself is lacking in length, but not in depth. The main quest set you up to learn about the people around you and then lets you make choices based upon your own preferences. Or you don't even have to act at all and can rush through the story as quickly as you want. This again is much of a mirror of the earlier Fallout games, and that you can ignore side content and rush to the end, or you can actually play a role in this role-playing game and make decisions outside of the main story that matter. What's most fulfilling about the main questline is that you receive support on your prison assault based on which factions like you. If you find the peaceful solutions for all major factions, then they will all send support teams to help you overthrow the board and begin to fix the major problems that are plaguing Halcyon, such as starvation, labor, separation between the lower and upper class, and general safety. You also have the option to turn Phineas in and side with the board, plunging Halcyon into arguably more chaos than what you caused when siding with Phineas. You have real choice, with real consequences all throughout the game, and the main mission ropes you into discovering these situations and making choices that affect life all across Halcyon. I said it in my Borderlands 3 review, and it rings true for Outer Worlds. I would rather have a succinct and concise story rather than a game full of padding. 
There is very little padding in this game, aside from overtly explanatory dialogue, but I really can't fault the game for putting in too much effort when it comes to world building and lore. The main questline of Outer Worlds has stakes, character development, and character arcs at the expense of length, which is a trade-off that all players should be willing to make. Although I don't find it as important as the content surrounding the main quest, there is very little that I can fault aside from the ending that I feel is a bit abrupt. I feel as though I have learned many of the ins and outs of Halcyon and their respective factions across this solar system. I know about their goals, objectives, and how the people feel about living there. I know of their struggles and their triumphs, all while meeting creative and distinct characters throughout the experience. If you play games just for the main story, not only will you not enjoy Outer Worlds, but you are just playing playing the game wrong. RPGs aren't just about the main quest, and if you didn't learn that lesson from Skyrim or Fallout, then I don't know why you would even bother with this game, or RPGs in general. Basically, if you have more than a 35 IQ and read at a higher than 5th grade level, I feel as though you will be satisfied with the main story and all of the content surrounding it. The overall side quest design in Outer Worlds is beyond just going somewhere, grabbing something, killing something, and going back. There is depth in the side quest design, and there are twists and turns that allow you to manipulate the world around you and feel as though you have an effect on the situations that you find yourself in. There is very little linearity, instead the developers give the player many different ways to go about completing these quests. Not to mention that there is a clear distinction between side quests and tasks. Side quests have stories, choices, and a myriad of places for you to travel and explore. Tasks are fetch quests. Roseway is an amazing example. You receive a distress beacon and go to investigate. From there you learn about what happened to this society, and it branches into a handful of quests that you can explore in order to learn more about what happened here. Basically, it is an Anti-Cleo owned research base that was experimenting on raptodons, a dinosaur-like creature, in order to make a toothpaste that suppresses appetites. Basically diet toothpaste. Their base is on the down low, so they receive very little support from Auntie Cleo or the board and are struggling to survive amongst the marauders and dangerous animals that they are experimenting on. In one specific instance on Roseway, you are sent to investigate a lab that was ground zero to the experiments on Raptodons. You go in to deal with the marauders that have infested the base, deal with the Raptodons that have breached containment, and also need to secure information for one of the scientists back at Roseway proper. This is already more multifaceted and shows more depth in side quest design than games that are praised for having a lot of side content, like Borderlands 3, Fallout 4, and Skyrim except their side content is no more than fetch quests, which has been plaguing the RPG genre for years. Outer Worlds introduces layers of depth, characters, and stakes into the side content, which is an overall better experience than spelunking into a cave to find an old family heirloom, or sprint across Pandora to shoot something and press X on what it spits out. You have three things to do. Plus, there is another side quest that takes place inside the same facility for a completely different scientist. In total, this one area houses four separate objectives. Deal with the Marauders, deal with the Raptodons, secure the data for Science Man, and complete an experiment that was being worked on by another Science Man. Although that, that may seem rather simplistic on the surface, you are simply interacting with things in the most basic of ways, killing, pressing X or A or something, and returning, the situation escalates and adds layers of complexity onto these seemingly simple objectives. For starters, there's an optional objective. Science Man asks you to pacify some of the Raptodons so that they can continue their research. Once you arrive at the lab, you then learn that in order to complete this optional, you need to find three tanks of laughing gas to pacify the Raptodons, then install the tanks and release the gas into the rooms housing them. Obviously, you have the option to kill all the Raptodons and fail that optional objective. 
Failing the optional reduces the amount of experience you gain once you complete the quest, so the player is incentivized to jump through these extra hoops, assuming they weren't already invested by other circumstances surrounding the quest. Plus, it adds a layer of depth in that you have to explore the entire facility to make sure that you don't miss those three tanks. On top of this, upon arriving at the lab, you are greeted by a security team that is working for Aunt Cleo. They have the marauders trapped and task you with going in there to deal with them. Along the way you meet the leader of the marauders. She has the data you need for the scientist and uses that as leverage to try and convince you to help them escape so that her people aren't slaughtered. Through dialogue choices and actions, you can peacefully relieve the situation so that there is no needless death. On top of this, once you clear the way for the marauders to escape, you can lie to their leader and get the information that you need. You get everything that you want, plus have tangible choices that matter as the quest progresses. So as a quick rundown, you are given somewhat simple objectives and an optional objective for a little more challenge, but those objectives evolve as the situation unfolds during the quest. You then take control of that situation and dictate how it unfolds based upon the player's ideologies and decisions. If you're feeling like a total asshole, then kill both sides plus the Dino Dogos and report back that it was a heinous massacre. If you are a saint, then negotiate the survival of both parties, neutralize the angry puppos, and report back a fully successful mission. In other games, side quests are nothing more than one to two dimensional filler content that tasks you with completing the most basic of objectives. Go here, press a button, come back. Go here, kill something, go back. Go here, pick something up, go back, or any combination of all of those things. Outer Worlds is a raving success in creating side content that is impactful and full of depth. You have options on how you want to tackle the situation at hand, plus the situation can escalate and complicate as you learn more about the stakes and the characters. I felt for both sides, so I tried as much as I could to help with minimal bloodshed. The leader of the Marauders cared enough for her people, and the security team were all just slaves to a corporation. Neither side deserved to die, and it was wonderful to have actual choice in a game to allow that vision to come to fruition, rather than just being told to kill the Marauders. Not only are the side missions compelling and offer choice to the player, you also can mess up side quests so badly that the game considers them botched. This even includes missions that result in the recruitment of companions. For example, if you speed through the main questline on Terra 2 before you do the Vicar's quest and side with the Botanical Center, then the Vicar will permanently be hostile towards you. So even if you have his banned book and talk to him multiple times before, he will shoot you on sight. I didn't have the Vicar as a companion for the rest of the game because I had to fucking kill him. I also botched quests like Die Robot, Fistful of Digits, and A Small Grave Matter, all because I made the occupants of Edgewater permanently hostile towards me. This ability to fail quests puts tension onto players that want to experience everything that the game has to offer. I was unable to on my first playthrough because of my poor decision making and lust to progress the game. Like I touched on in the introduction and main story portion, much of this game has mirroring elements from Fallout New Vegas, including faction development. There are five primary factions, Groundbreaker, Iconoclasts, Monarch Stellar Industries or MSI, Sublight Salvage, and The Board. There are also four secondary factions, those being Auntie Cleo, CMP Borst Factory, The Deserters, and Spacer's Choice. Not all of the factions directly interact, but your influence on those factions matter. You can have a positive or negative reputation based upon your actions, some factions even revering you for your choices. I thought the way that all these factions have differing opinions and outlooks was well crafted and well thought out. I can see all factions' perspectives, understand how they built those values, and why they think those values are for the greatest good of their people. Many characters have personalities that you can read into, and there are varying degrees of humor and sarcasm throughout. 
The faction leaders aren't just brick walls barking orders. They are dedicated to their respective causes because of life experiences and personality traits. Speaking of faction leaders being characters, let's talk about some of the characters. Characters in this game have personality and goals. Outer Worlds is chock full of actual characters. All of your companions have distinct values, personality traits, and goals that you can read into and learn more about as you interact with them and take them places. For, the, for example, the first companion for many players will be Parvardi. She is an aspiring engineer who has been trapped for her whole life on Edgewater. She never really knew her mother, and was raised solely by her father. The reason for this, that you can find out by talking to her, is that her mother was considered more important by society than her father. They were forcefully separated because the work her mother was doing was not only more important than her father's, but was also more important than being able to live with and raise her own child. Hearing about this was one of the reasons why I sided with Phineas and turned off Edgewater, by the way. Not only was she separated from her mother practically at birth, but she also lost her father early on in her life. He was falling ill, but was unable to quit working, or even cut down on his hours, so he ended up working himself into an early grave. You pick her up, and after more discussion, learn that she is a shy and reserved soul that has social anxiety and a fear of physical intimacy. Later on, you discover that Parvati is also a lesbian, but the game never glorifies this fact or overtly goes out of its way to shove that in your face. She is just a character that happens to be gay, and in a world where most pieces of entertainment are played with political messages and attempts to brainwash their audience, I really must commend Obsidian for having restraint and not putting these types of overt messages into the game. Unlike another game that I begrudgingly played this year. Don't get me wrong though, this game has a strong anti-business and anti-government message throughout, but does not take sides on controversial current day political topics. The businesses and government in place in, Hal in Halcyon are overtly corrupt and are protecting their own wealth and prosperity by stepping on the common people who are barely scraping by. There are examples of this in the real world, yes, but it's not like there is a sentient Cheeto Puff sending you propaganda tweets every three hours. This aversion from modern political messages will also help Outer Worlds age well, as being anti-big business, anti-corrupt government, and anti-big brother are timeless topics worth exploring. Anyway, Parvardi's companion quest is based around her trying to win herself a girlfriend. Jean Lee Tennyson is the chief engineer on the Groundbreaker, whom you meet during the main story missions. Parvardi eventually musters up the courage to ask her out, and you two fly across the galaxy to make Jun Lee's favorite dish, favorite dessert, get Parvardi a nice dress, and a bath in a bottle. If that isn't enough to convince you the depth of the characters in this game, then watch this clip of our conversation after her successful date. Thank you. Perhaps in time I'll... She stood stock still and just said, Oh, real soft. Oh, and let me tell you, I was sweating. And then she blinked and said, Is that dustback casserole? I told her how we got Mr. Raymond to bake it for us, so it was double authentic. Made by a real live... Monar monarchian? Monarchist? Monarch person. I sure was. Near best thing to homemade, June Lay said. When I brung out the sweetheart cakes, June, she got a little teary. Said she had a thing she needed to say. But I stopped her because I wanted to say it first. I never felt so bold, Captain. I told her about how she made me feel. Bold like I acted. Strong. Smarter and kinder than I am on my lonesome. I listed all the things I liked about her. 
And then she pulled out a paper and read a speech. She, she talked about the things she admired about me, like my cleverness and my humor and how it made her want to be more open. Anyhow, when she wrapped up, I asked her to be my girlfriend. And Captain, she said yes! And then she sneezed again, on account of the flowery soap. It's all on your account, you know. Imagine if you'd never taken me out of Edgewater. I'd have never met Jun Lei at all. I don't know nothing about the law or the capital P plan, but you sure changed my life. So, if you don't mind, I'm just gonna head to my cabin and happy scream into my pillow for like an hour. Sanitizing within a st I could go on here too. It's not just Parvati that has depth. All the other companions, aside from Sam, who is a sanitation robot modified into a killing machine, have the same level of effort put into them, and have a companion quest that strengthens your bond along with teaching you new things about that character. The only companion that I didn't really jive with was Felix, and I cannot speak about Max because I killed him before I was able to recruit him. Alongside your companions, you also have well thought out characters like Phineas, Ada, Gladys, Hiram, Sanjar, Zora, and Udom Bedford to name a few. Most, if not all of the characters are believable and have unique traits and values. Obsidian really went above and beyond on character development in Outer Worlds and it shows. Like I mentioned before, there is a strong anti-establishment message within Outer Worlds. I feel as though this theme is thoroughly explored throughout the story as you begin to learn more about the board and their ulterior motives. Every planet that you explore, aside from one, is a wasteland where the citizens there are just barely scraping by. They are all just drone workers, throwing away their lives to run assembly lines. They've been brainwashed to believe that their hard work will be rewarded, that they will advance to the ranks and make more money, but that just isn't the case. These worlds represent the 99% of society, the working class individuals that will never experience any great qualities of life and will forever toil under somebody else's boot until they inevitably keel over and are replaced. The other world, Byzantium, represents the 1% of society that never has to work and is enjoying wealth and prosperity. Not to mention that all the mega corporations are corrupt or unethical in some way or another. The Bors factory experiments with growth chemicals on their workers. Ante Cleo has an off-the-grid settlement that is experimenting on dangerous animals. Spacer's Choice workers are straight up suicidal and the company doesn't care at all, and the deserters pick and choose who is allowed to live with them, casting out others and forcing them to become marauders or to fall victim to Teratu's wildlife. Or fall victim to marauders. Outer Worlds was not going for realism, or even semi-realism when it comes to the graphical choice. The game looks good, and runs great, which is all I ask for. The color palette is diverse, areas have a variety of different colors that reflect the tone of the area, and characters' outfits pop, especially when engaging in dialogue with them. Speaking of dialogue, the facial mapping in this game is amazing. Characters will furrow their brow and frown if they are angry, their eyes will light up and will smile if they are joyful. It is always apparent how a character is feeling just by looking at their face, which is an, an incredible feat for gaming and 3D model design. Despite animated movies having this type of care put into facial expressions, video games have always been lacking in that category, except for pre-rendered cutscenes. Fortunately, thanks to pre-rendered cutscenes and advances in graphical fidelity, we're finally entering the age where characters have distinctive characteristics and realistic expressions. On top of this, characters in Outer Worlds have scars and wrinkles, along with different eye, nose, lip, and eyebrow shapes. The entire shape of the face can be different too. Some characters have thin faces, like Ellie and Parvati, whereas others have fatter faces, more rounded chins, etc. Lastly, and I may have mentioned this earlier, the eye design is probably the best I've ever seen in a game. You spend so much time looking at faces in this game that it would be easy to notice laziness, but it all looks stunning.
In most games, the dialogue is written at like a fourth grade level. Characters have the most basic of traits, and their dialogue is nothing more than one-liners on top of ominous lines like- Give me a moment to explain! Don't you understand what has taken place? You have no idea the magnitude of what you're dealing with! You must listen, or all hope will- Outer Worlds has much more depth and creativity in terms of word choice. I'm no wordsmith, but I feel as though I'm a bit more verbose than the average bear. I can say for certain that there was someone with a thesaurus reading and modifying dialogue so that words weren't used too many times through the game. It all feels fresh and dynamic, especially the player character's dialogue choices, which have a variety of emotions and implications. You are not given the illusion of dialogue options like in Fallout 4. You know exactly what you're going to say, and the impact that it will have on who you are speaking to. Also, there isn't any lowbrow humor to get cheap laughs out of the simpletons behind the screen. Much of the dialogue-driven humor you have to read between the lines to understand. For example, when confronting Ellie's parents, one of the lines you can say is, If you know anything about your daughter, you'll know that she is anything but quiet. Now my mind could just be living in the gutters, but I feel as though that was a subtle sex joke. Regardless, I read it as such, and it made me laugh. In the last section of The Good, I'm going to rattle off some game mechanics that are objectively great and well integrated into the game. To start, we have the 100-point leveling system, which has made a triumphant return from Fallout New Vegas. You have a multitude of categories that can be leveled from 0 to 100. Every 20 points in a category grants you a perk, allowing you to specialize in a handful of things before you reach the level cap. Next are speech checks, which are tied into the 100-point system. Speech checks are very common, and give you ways to bypass obstacles without using other means such as violence, hacking, lockpicking, or sneaking around. Plus, you get some extra XP, and get to sound like a smarty pants every time you succeed in engineering or medical check, or a badass every time you successfully lie or intimidate. There are two types of perks in Outer Worlds. Perks are tied to skills which unlock every 20 points, and perks that are tied to leveling up. Both sets are fair and balanced, with the best perks unlocking at the highest tiers. If you plow through the story, you may find yourself drastically underleveled and underpowered. By the end of the story, you should be an absolute monster, with next to unlimited TTD, guns that hit like dump trucks, and armor that could withstand a tactical nuke. Some other quality of life features that I am fond of are being able to respec your character if the desire arises, breaking down armor and weapons for upgrade points directly from an enemy's inventory, vending machines being placed in convenient locations all around the maps, Weapons can be constantly upgraded, so if you find a weapon in the early game that you like, you can upgrade it to keep it viable as you progress through the game. And lastly, speech checks are simply pass or fail, rather than based on chance or random percentages. In overview, this game has a ton to offer, and I was left very pleased. Obsidian made a strong effort here, and it shows. Every RPG element that you expect to be nailed down and polished are. The combat is passable, the dialogue is excellent, and the story elements are vastly different from player to player based upon how they play the game. I'm really excited to do a couple more playthroughs, one for the board ending, one where I am a deranged psycho murderer, and another where I will be wholly diplomatic and complete all the side missions. Thus far I have completed the game twice and only missed a couple of side quests and I've spent a total of 30 hours in the game. As we move into the bad, I want to remind the remaining audience that while I try to remain objective, I do venture into opinion territory. I don't expect everyone to agree with me, especially considering the firewall of hate and spam that I had to delete off of my Borderlands 3 review, but do keep in mind that some things in games are objectively bad, others are objectively good, and the gray area is where opinions go. Some of these critiques may fall into the gray area. Yes, um, about that. We were just about to ask you to, uh, leave. Arguably a big start to the gray area that I just mentioned is the length of Outer Worlds. There's plenty of content, but the only major differences between playthroughs are the story beats that you experience. Other than that, if you are a completionist and methodically scan each planet for side missions, you are very likely to find and complete every side quest that the game has to offer. On my first playthrough, I did just that, scoured through every nook and cranny of the maps to find whatever side content I could. 
after comparing it to the side quest lists online, I discovered that I had done everything that the game offered aside from three to five botched quests from the Edgewater settlement. Not only that, but the ending of the story seems a bit rushed. Despite being well thought out and many of the story missions having a handful of ways to complete them, the ending sort of comes out of nowhere. You send the hope either closer to Phineas's lab or send it to Tartarus, then have a jailbreak or jail recapture mission before the game is over. In my first playthrough, I met one of the main antagonists an entire 20 minutes before breaking down her door and putting a round in her brain. We had a brief Skype call before I sent a war party to Tartarus and broke Phineas out of captivity. In my other playthrough, I played a double agent as long as I could before ultimately siding with Phineas again and was able to meet and even work for Sophia Akande, who is the main villain that I barely came in contact with my first playthrough. It makes me curious if Obsidian ended up in a time crunch and didn't have time to include a handful of missions between the meeting of Akande and the end of the game. This would make sense considering that there are a handful of planets that you do not visit during the game and one planet that only has like three total objectives attributed to it. I understand that some planets are deemed uninhabitable, but after seeing the rush state of the final missions, it makes me wonder if these planets were planned to be visited but had to be scrapped somewhere late in development. All Outer Worlds needed was a handful more story missions to solidify Akande and Chairman Rockwell as your main adversaries, since by this point in the game you have clearly chosen a path to follow, either for or against Saving Hope's colonists. In its current state, if you are siding with Phineas, you mate Akande and then kill her no more than 20 minutes later. Chairman Rockwell is also a questionable figure that I didn't know much about, but he was name dropped more than Akande. This is less of a problem if you decide to side against Phineas, because his character is already established, and you get to spend much more time learning about Akande and Rockwell. However, I don't think that many players will choose this option, and I also think that many players will not play through the game more than once. Therefore, a majority of players that saw Outer Worlds to the end will have seen a less than stellar ending that comes out of nowhere. With that being said, I'm not an expert on games and their subsequent retention rates, but we can use achievement percentages to determine how much content a majority of players see in a game. For a brief example, the achievement Ticket to Anywhere is unlocked after you handle the conflicts between the first two major settlements, which is relatively early in the game. Only 50% of players have even gotten to that point. To solidify this example, only 12.63% of Xbox players have beaten the game on any difficulty. I wish there were specific achievements tied to which ending you received so that I could solidify this point further, but if I know anything about the typical gamer, they're going to want to save the colonists and say fuck you to the board. Maybe I'm wrong on that, but I would really be surprised to hear otherwise. To wrap this all up, there are two sides to this coin. It is without a doubt a very positive thing that I am left wanting more content from this game, but it is also a negative that Outer Worlds doesn't manage to stick the landing and deliver a satisfying conclusion to the main story. All I can hope for is that they plan on releasing a direct sequel that attempts to quell some of these qualms. It pains me to bash this aspect of the game, mainly because I feel like a petty Iceborne fan crying over weapon designs, but Outer Worlds is seriously lacking in the armor and weapon design department. Aside from minor color palette changes and different sized armor based on its weight, there aren't major differences between armor sets. Maybe this is some deep-seated joke at the clothing industry and how they are peddling the exact same products with different logos on them, but I felt underwhelmed with the overall creativity of the armor and weapons. Some of the coolest weapons are the science weapons that you can rarely find about the world, and the only one that really stuck out was the shrink ray, mainly because it looked like a knockoff version of the ray gun from Call of Duty Zombies. Some may view this as a petty complaint, or a gray area opinion that is based in fact, but in comparison to other RPGs on the market, you cannot deny that Outer Worlds is lacking. Skyrim, the staple of all RPGs, has the Daedra and Dragonbone armor, which still looks impressive in late 2019. Fallout has power armor, along with some unique outfits that you can find around the world, like the old-fashioned scuba suit from Fallout 4 that looks like it was pulled straight out of an old Scooby-Doo cartoon. The weapon design is also much better all around in those games, in comparison to the blocky and uninspired weapons of Outer Worlds. 
However, given that the rest of the game was such a breath of fresh air, this isn't a major hindrance, and in fact, these are the only two complaints that I had with the game. This should be even more compelling considering that one of my major complaints was that there wasn't enough Outer Worlds. If I am left wanting more out of a game, that is a compliment and a shortcoming wrapped in one. These days, we don't get much in the way of variety. The only thing that is average about Outer Worlds is its gunplay. In Outer Worlds, it feels like they never really evolved from Fallout New Vegas. It is stoic and lacks fluidity. Look at how Doom 2016 evolved its combat mechanics from previous entries. It is fast and emphasizes speed and style. Going into a glory kill is flashy, fluid, and dynamic. Explosions shake your screen and feel like they have weight and impact along with the Doom Slayer himself. Battlefield 5 has evolved since the original entries, now emphasizing gun skill and map knowledge, such as knowing where power positions are along with ammo and health crates, and utilizing skills and traits that are associated with the four main classes. Outer Worlds has limited slow-mo and a short dash mechanic. It is point and shoot, hold the trigger until your enemy is dead, or you are. Find some cover if it is available and pick off your enemies. It isn't terrible by any stretch of the imagination, but utilizing guns feels sluggish, and is sometimes downright unrewarding. Another good describing word for the combat in Outer Worlds is standard, which is why it is rightfully placed here in the average category. I understand that the focal point of this game is more centered around your interactions with characters, the story, and the side quests, but games have evolved since the dog days of the slow and methodical Skyrim and Fallout combat. Simply adding slow motion and a side hop mechanic isn't enough innovation in the gun handling aspect of the game. Now I'm not saying that there needs to be Call of Duty or Battlefield levels of polish in terms of the gunplay, but it would be nice to feel like I don't have to wear heavy armor, because no matter what my character is wearing, it feels like I'm piloting a lead fridge. I also feel as though tactical time dilation was not only next to useless, but would have been much better off if it were just more like Vats from Fallout. This would help with the sluggish combat, and would also remove some of the need for the gunplay to be more satisfying and fluid. I try not to reuse the same word too many times in my reviews, and I also try to express and describe my feelings adequately, but for something like this, the best I can say is... Using guns doesn't feel satisfying, and Obsidian hasn't struck a balance between fluidity and stoic, methodical combat. They are stuck in the middle, and it leaves the player feeling as though they are stuck in a combat limbo. I really wanted to enjoy fighting in this game, but it's just so standard and stiff. I'm just gonna head to my cabin and happy scream into my pillow for like an hour. The biggest compliment that I can give to Outer Worlds overall is that your decisions matter. Something I emphasized throughout this review was how pleased I was with the choices aspect of this game. There is not fake choice or fake decision making in this game. If you think that something is going to have an engineering, medical, or science check, you're going to be right. If there is a certain way that you want to respond to someone, whether that be to intimidate or persuade them, there's going to be a check for that. If you think that there's a way for two factions to put aside their differences and find a way to work together, there's a way for you to make that happen. Not all of those choices are black and white, either. There's going to be moral and ethical pushes and pulls that are you, you are going to have to come to terms with in order for a colony to come together and thrive. Like killing the leader of one faction in order to replace him with a more friendly and compatible companion to another faction. Most of the dialogue was stellar, well-written, poignant, and humorous in appropriate moments. Characters have depth, charisma, and individual personalities, especially your companions, who all have differing goals, agendas, moral compasses, and drives. You, the player character, also has a diverse personality that you can shape to make your own, or change to be a certain way for a certain playthrough. For many players, I imagine that their first time through, they will either choose dialogue options that most reflect their own beliefs and build a character around that, or they will roleplay as if this were a Dungeons and Dragons character, or oh, I don't know, a character in a roleplaying game. To close, in a market of stale, wannabe roleplaying games that only tacked on that label to attract a certain audience, Outer Worlds is a breath of fresh air. This game allows you to play a role in every aspect of a character that you should come to expect. 
if you want to be a charismatic sniper that is excellent at stealth, critical attacks, picking locks, persuasion, and lying, you can do that. If you want to be a total asshole, an unstoppable force that has a heart of gold, you can focus on heavy weapons, two-handed melee, intimidation, inspiration, and determination. If you want to be a big-brained pacifist that prefers to avoid combat and solve matters peacefully, you would emphasize medical, science, engineering, hacking, and persuading. The list goes on. Basically, if you have an idea for a character, Outer Worlds has a way for you to be creative and make that character come to life. One thing to keep in mind, though, is that if you are going to try and be a jack of all trades, you will be a master of none. You cannot max out all of your stats and have to pick what sort of character you want to have by the end, which I think is wonderful and adds certain aspects of personality to the individual characters created. To conclude, I think that anyone that is interested in role-playing games, games with stats, numbers, and perks, games with good stories, or games with good characters should play Outer Worlds. I was thrilled to be blown away by a gaming experience this year after suffering through disappointment after disappointment. This is a product that I was happy to pay full price for, as it delivered in every category that I expected from it. My rating is a full $60 out of $60, but you can also play this game in its entirety for free if you are a member of the Xbox Game Pass, which is really just icing on the cake. Pick this game up as soon as you can, and I'd love to hear how you built your first character and what factions you sided with down in the comments below. Thank you for watching, and happy holidays.